This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. The award-winning 1962 film, The Manchurian Candidate, tells the tale of an American POW in the Korean War who was brainwashed by the communist Chinese and set loose back in the United States as an unwitting assassin for an international communist conspiracy. The plot centers on Korean War veteran Raymond Shaw, part of a prominent political family, and is now running for office in the United States of America. Several years before, Shaw was brainwashed by the communists after his army platoon was captured in the Korean War and then brainwashed by members of the Communist Chinese Party and the Soviet Union. He returns to civilian life in the United States, where he becomes an unwitting assassin in an international communist conspiracy. This communist group, which includes representatives of the People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union, had plans to assassinate the presidential nominee of an American political party with the hopeful leading to the overthrow of the U.S. government. And Shaw was their Manchurian candidate, ready to spring into action when called upon to assassinate the potential president of the United States and throw the United States into disorder and confusion, which the communists hoped would lead to the downfall and overthrow of the United States government. About 40 years later, in 2004, the Manchurian candidate would be remade by a modern Hollywood studio. And this time, while the name of the novel in the earlier film was retained, the significance of Manchurian was changed. In the original, the protagonist was captured in the Korean War and brainwashed, of course, by the Chinese in actual Manchuria. But in the new 2004 film, with the Korean War replaced by the Gulf War, Manchurian is used instead as the name of a sinister multinational corporation. Manchurian Global, a powerful private equity firm, with major political connections. While the two movies, 40 years apart, describe two separate enemies, both today in 2022 can be seen as portraying more truth than fiction. And by this I mean politicians and candidates who are manipulated by the Chinese government, where in many instances, especially when it comes to policy that has to do with the Chinese government or what would actually favor the Chinese government economically or politically or militarily, well, they are told to bypass the Constitution, where they are told to allow the Chinese Communist Party to have interest in crucial businesses, such as with food delivery, with the creation of prescription medications, with the creation of essential goods in the United States. Like I said, food distribution, food creation, or in port and logistics, or in education. The interests of the Chinese Communist Party are fully infused in the political life of the United States, but also in Canada, in Europe, in the United Kingdom, in the Middle East, in Australia and New Zealand. And while much of this has been through debt diplomacy as part of China's Belt and Road Initiative, quite a bit more has been done through a process known as dripping dripping rivers of cash and opportunities to candidates and businesses to gain influence and to manipulate policy, domestic political policy, foreign political policy, economic policy, and public health policy. For instance, if we were to take a look at what's happening within the Biden administration currently, our current head of the CDC, who was appointed by Joe Biden, is a woman whose name is Rochelle Walensky. Prior to her appointment by President Joe Biden, Rochelle Walensky was the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases 
at Massachusetts General Hospital and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, both of which were significantly funded by brothers Gerald and Ronnie Chan, of course, who are vying for and cheering for an autocratic change within America and as well a gradualistic decline of America that would favor China. Now, the School of Public Health at Harvard became the T.H. Chan School of Public Health in 2014 after receiving a $350 million gift from the Morningside Foundation, a foundation, of course, that Gerald and Ronnie Chan used for funneling cash into interested parties in the United States and the United Kingdom. So, Dr. Rochelle Walensky had been at two institutions that went so far as to rename themselves in honor of the namesake of Ronnie Chan, who has been influential in the overthrow of Hong Kong and in the manipulating of public health policy in the United States. So the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard utilizes identity politics and critical race theory in the implementation of health equity, which you should immediately understand as medical Marxism. And yes, just for a side note here, I do know Ronnie Chan and his family, And they are very nice and generous people. And that's the thing about all of this that's happening on around us, is that many of the people that are involved, this is the thing that they do. But it doesn't necessarily reflect how they interact with people personally. So Ronnie and Gerald are very nice people. But I believe that they have taken a very red, very left turn over the past many years. Well, actually, this was the direction they have been going down for much of their lives. That would be consistent with his leadership, and this would be Ronnie, in the Asia Society and his involvement in the Council on Foreign Relations and as well the World Economic Forum. As the Harvard Crimson would ask, who is Ronnie Chan? Well, they would refer to Jimmy Lai, the recently arrested Hong Kong pro-democracy news mogul dubbed him, and this would be Ronnie, as a pawn of the CCP on Twitter and perhaps rightly so. As Ronnie Chan's Hong Lung group has expanded from Hong Kong into the mainland, Ronnie Chan has found himself increasingly defensive of Beijing's encroachment on Hong Kong. For one, he was an outspoken supporter of Leung Chengying, the former chief executive of Hong Kong, whose tenure was marked by massive protests over attempts at giving Beijing the ability to pre-screen the city's leadership. Ronnie Chan's tenure as co-chair of the Asia Society's Hong Kong chapter proves particularly revealing of his ideology. During his time at the helm, the organization canceled the screening of a film centered on the 2014 Umbrella Movement citing political concerns and barred Joshua Wong, a leader of the Umbrella Movement who has faced repeated state harassment for his work, from the event. Such concerns are certainly warranted. That same year, Ronnie Chan received the Grand Bahunia, and I might be mispronouncing that, the Grand Bahunia Medal, the highest award offered by Hong Kong's government, cementing his ties with the mainland's political establishment. These ties are noticeable elsewhere, as Ronnie Chan is also the governor of the China United States Exchange Foundation, a registered foreign agent chaired by Tong Chi Hua, vice chairman of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Ronnie Chan has even faced accusations that he triggered the censoring and eventual termination of Forbes magazine contributor Anders Kaur in 2008, who I know, who wrote a piece critical of Ronnie Chan only to watch it vanish from the Forbes website the following morning. The events highlight Ronnie Chan's role within a broader push by Beijing authorities to exert control over speech not only at home, but abroad, ranging from blacklisting and expelling foreign journalists to pressuring the NBA, the National Basketball Association, you know, in the United States and its affiliates to disavow tweets supportive of pro-democracy demonstrators in China and Hong Kong. Think about that. So you have a figure so linked to the polity behind these efforts and allegedly responsible for some censorship himself that could be honored by Harvard University and even have a school named after his late father, 
really is unconscionable. Pair this with Ronnie Chan's relationship with Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, who has for over a decade enjoyed trips with the Asia Society and Ronnie Chan to China, who is one of the most tyrannical in lockdowns in Los Angeles. And it was Eric Garcetti that encouraged the citizens of Los Angeles to snitch on one another. Now, if we look back at the China-United States Exchange Foundation, and again, this controversial foundation is registered as a foreign agent, but it targets American universities with donations that are usually refused by schools and then taken by institutions, even in light of these ties. And there are ties with Chinese interests with Mitch McConnell, with Republicans in the House and the Senate, with Republicans in governor's mansions across the United States. And there is more, quite a bit more. But I do want you to think about this. The one sure connection that we have is Rochelle Walensky of the CDC. Rochelle Walensky, of course, who has been directing our public policy in regards to our lockdowns, in regards to who can now charge for rent and who can't. And as well, think about this. The CDC is also the one that is pushing health equity as well as critical race theory within its understanding of how to evaluate medical needs. Again, this is called health equity, medical Marxism. And that person, Rochelle Walensky, has been responding as the T.H. Chan School of Public Health would have her respond. It really is a scandal. You have to understand that in many ways, Rochelle Walensky has become almost a Manchurian candidate. But again, there is more. And there are other players in the China-influenced political game. And by that, I mean, of course, that this isn't just in the United States. Well, as Peter Schweitzer reports in his best-selling book, Red Handed, (sighs) Justin Trudeau, he has ties to China that have on occasion stretched the limits of Canadian law. In 2016, for example, The Globe and Mail revealed that Trudeau had attended a fundraiser in which he had a private conversation with Chinese businessman Zhang Bing, who then promptly donated one million Canadian dollars to the Pierre Trudeau Foundation. Zhang was, in addition to a businessman, a Chinese regime advisor, making him essentially a lobbyist for a foreign power. Now, outside of the strictly political, Justin Trudeau also appeared to receive financial and ideological support from Beijing. As Schweitzer details, a Chinese state-owned publisher released a Chinese version of the younger Trudeau's memoirs. The legend continues. (laughs) In 2016, quote, Curiously, some of Trudeau's national security aides were not even aware that the rights of his memoir had been sold to Beijing and not finding out this until about 2021. After being contacted by the media, Schweitzer notes, quote, Trudeau aides would later explain that all of the profits from the book were going to the Red Cross, but the Globe and Mail newspaper could not confirm that claim with either the publisher or the Red Cross, end quote. Trudeau's brother and foreign policy advisor, Alexandra, entered the family business of publishing books in China in 2016. I am quite aware of this business, by the way, and also of how book publishing has been working in China, especially for the Christian book market. Anyway, Trudeau's brother, Alexander, entered the family business of publishing books in China in 2016, the year after Justin became prime minister. Barbarian Loss Travels in the New City of China was largely sold as an update to Two Innocents in Red China. At the time of its release, Schweitzer documents, Alexander, Alexander Trudeau, used the book to compare the West unfavorably to the rule of the repressive Communist Party, asserting, quote, I now look at our own freedoms with a little more circumspection and consider some of the irresponsible nature of some of the freedoms we enjoy, end quote. So this is just the scratching of the surface of Chinese foreign interference, because Justin Trudeau's open influence, his political, strategic, and economic influence, has not just been from China, even though in many ways he can be considered as a Manchurian candidate of China, 
But his greater influence has actually been from the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab. Justin Trudeau, who is a young leader with the World Economic Forum. Justin Trudeau, who was praised openly in Davos just a few years ago by Klaus Schwab. Justin Trudeau, who stated in the fall of 2020, quote, This pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. This is our chance to articulate our pre-pandemic effort to reimagine economic systems that actually address global challenges like extreme poverty, inequality, and climate change. End quote. Yes, Justin Trudeau's echoing the very words of Klaus Schwab's COVID-19 and the Great Reset, Klaus Schwab's own book. Putting the plan into action that would transform Canada from a loose democracy with a parliamentary system and into an autocratic, oligarchical technocracy. And of course, who is Justin Trudeau's deputy prime minister? Christia Freeland. Christia Freeland, who is on the board of trustees for the World Economic Forum. And so you start to examine who in the Canadian government is associated with or has had dealings with the World Economic Forum. Well, one would be Minister of Finance of Canada, Bill Morneau, who promoted Canada's strong economic position and the government's economic plan at the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland, at their last physical meeting in 2020. And so Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum had help in setting up their Canadian infiltration mission including from Trudeau's former chief of staff, Gerald Butts, a participant in the World Economic Forum's Davos conferences and a leading backroom organizer of the Trudeau government's ideological gambits. And please understand, people that are loyal to the World Economic Forum more than they are to their own nation are running the nation of Canada. So when it comes to subversive plans to overthrow the free world economy, Few are larger in scope than the World Economic Forum's global scheme to remake the world and install a new form of what they refer to as capitalism, which is not capitalism. It's based on the recruitment of corporate leaders into the role of government. And so over the past 40 years, the World Economic Forum infiltration of Ottawa has never been a secret, nor has Butts' involvement. But it is far from being common knowledge among voters that the ideological model behind the liberal policy machine, the steering mechanism that guides decisions and policies, is subversive and authoritarian, and it's coming from Davos. It also covers a massive policy territory, from climate change to COVID-19. So, in fact, you have a Manchurian candidate in Justin Trudeau. And this would be from the 2004 version of the film, where the corporate monster is playing the role as the manipulator. And it doesn't stop there. There's quite a bit more. And we'll get into that in a future episode, I'm sure, within the next few weeks. But know this, in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, in South America, in New Zealand and Australia... There has been infiltration. The Davos candidates that have infused themselves into national leadership and in cabinets all over what was previously the free world. They have infused themselves into corporate leadership throughout the world. They have infused themselves into religious institutions throughout the world. And now they are doing the duty that they were called to do. They are the Manchurian candidates who are here to reset the world. And by that I mean to reset all of our systems, our economic systems, our technological systems, our liberties. They want to install a new global social contract. They want to reset our national borders. They want to reorganize our society. They want to tell us what we can and cannot spend money on. They want to tell us what we can and can't eat. They want to tell us who we can hire and who we can fire. They want to tell us what ideologies we must support. 
They want to tell us what theologies we must hold and what theological convictions we can't hold. And they must be stopped. Because if we don't stop them, it will result in the end of humanity as we know it. And this is no hyperbole. The end of what we know as history, in the Fukuyama sense, could be at hand. So it is time to stand. It is time to speak. Because we must win. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic.